Yes. So a chief people officer in this organisation is the person who's on the board who's responsible for everything to do with employees. That might be attracting employees, the recruitment process to come and work at the organisation, making sure that we advertise in the right place to be really inclusive and that the people with the right skills come and work for the organisation. It also involves all of the human resources of when people work for the trust. That might be when things go wrong and there might be disciplinaries involved, making sure that the organisation is kept safe and that it's following all of the employment law that it's required to follow. But then the nicer, better part of my job that I really, really enjoy is making sure that everybody can bring their whole selves to work, be that in terms of any protected characteristics that they've got, um, that they feel safe to speak up at work, but also that they are highly trained, working to the absolute top of their skill set. They know where to go for information. They know who to apply to for additional um, qualifications or if they want to undergo training and that they know where to go um, to talk about their health and well-being and get any support that they might need. So I have a very wide ranging role from human resources, education, health and well-being, inclusion and diversity, medical education, nursing education. We give advice and guidance to every supervisor or line manager within the trust as well. Consistent guidance, hopefully, from HR that line managers can then manage their people consistently within the organisation as well. We also, as a team and um, within the people team, respond to the annual staff survey results. That's a really good insight into what's going on in the trust. And people tell us anonymously, give really, really good feedback about um, how they feel about working for the trust. And then I'm able to respond to that with um, supporting Sarah Jane and supporting the whole exec team in some of the HR interventions and projects and programmes that we can do, which can make an improvement um, to people's working lives. So priorities for 2021, I think um, everybody probably understands the beginning of 2021, colleagues are going to be thinking about getting the COVID vaccine as our patients, as our, our family members. I can't wait for my dad to get the vaccine. He's got COPD and I've not been able to hug him properly since March. So I'm very much looking forward to him getting the vaccine. I'll probably hug him um, for about three days solid. I have to book annual leave. I think in terms of the trust priorities, we are going to have to work very hard together as a team, supporting each other to rebuild confidence in what we were doing before. So if someone's been, for example, in my team working from home since March, coming back into work, working in an office with other people, even if you know they've been vaccinated and that the, um, the virus has gone away or at least been abated, that confidence to come into work and work in big groups or have big meetings, that's going to be a really big thing for our colleagues because they're going to be so used to working in that way from home. And so getting people back into work is going to be a real challenge. But that's a really small number of people who are working from home. I think the impact of COVID, so the impact on people's lives, um, what they value, what they think about, what they hold dear to them, um, I think that will change. People have really had a bit of a reset into what they deem as important and they are going to properly and rightly bring that into the workplace. And I think in particular that will be around um, inclusion and diversity and people not demanding their rights, but making sure that they have access to everything that they deserve and not standing for second best. And I think that's right and proper. And I think for me, in my role and for my team, that's going to mean that we are working really closely with our idea network and with our staff networks to make sure that people do have access to all of the support that they need. We don't know yet the longer term psychological impact on mental well-being or on physical well-being of um, the COVID pandemic. I think people will have seen and heard and experienced very difficult things. And obviously the long-term impact might be PTSD or even if it hasn't got as far as PTSD, people will be feeling very um, sort of lacking in confidence in coming back to work. So I think there's a lot of work for us to do in terms of rebuilding all of our colleagues' workforce and their confidence, but also um, in terms of making sure that the long-term impact on psychological well-being is absolutely planned for and managed. And then, of course, we've got to think about our patients um, and rebuilding their confidence in using all of our services again and getting back to some normal running. And I think that that's going to be at least the first six months of 2021. 
So there's a number of ways that um, I would want to do that. So thank you so much for being involved in my interview panel. I find it really interesting. Um, even though Zoom was being a bit wonky on that day, everybody did brilliantly. Um, and thank you for looking after me and for being so welcoming. You might know that um, part of my responsibility as Sheep People Officer is to look after all of the apprenticeships and work experience and learning that's offered at the Trust. We have something that's called widening participation, which is basically about trying to get more people from different backgrounds, different places in the city, um, all different schools and colleges involved in apprenticeships at our trust that you work um, for 20 percent. So you work for um, four out of the five days and then you have 20 percent off the job learning every week. Um, we don't involve people enough um, from work experience or from. Um, even just on, on consulting about the, the kind of learning that you would want to come and do at our organisation and what would be valuable for you. And we do plan to relaunch that in 2021. I'm very passionate about that. Um, you might know I have um, a 20 year old. So I have a 20 year old daughter called Annabelle. When I want to know things or when she thinks that I'm talking rubbish, she will tell me. And I think that's really valuable because I say things like, oh, I want to do you know, I want to do a new strategy on um, attracting young people to come and work in the trust. And then if I, for example, put all of those jobs on a website where young people would never, ever look um, or colleges and schools would never, ever refer you to those, then I'd be like putting them on a little island um, all by myself. And that would be completely pointless. So I feel that we have to involve young people in what I'm doing um, to make sure it's accessing the people that we absolutely need to see it. But also, I think it's really useful when young people like yourself tell us when we're getting it really wrong and when we're saying stuff that you absolutely don't understand, you think, well, why are you saying that? That's completely pointless. Um, and so it's important that we have the honest voices of service users, of patients, of future patients, but also of people that are living, on, um, living in Birmingham and potentially wanting to work for our organisation in the future. That honesty is really refreshing you often cut through the rubbish and get to the point, which I find really, really valuable. So please keep speaking up. Um, come and have a chat to me um, and I'll consult with you on what we're going to do around relaunching work experience. And I really look forward to working with you. This is the start of week eight with the organisation. It seems ages ago, doesn't it, that we had that hot day where you helped with my interview process back in June. Um, so everyone's been fantastic. I started here on the 27th of October. It's been really hard actually meeting people on Zoom or through masks because normally you'd meet maybe 50, 60 people in one room and have the chance to be in each other's energy and to kind of get a vibe on um, who's who and, um, who and get to meet loads of people at once. So I have met lots of people at once, including my own people team on Zoom, for example, um, and also the whole organisation when Sarah Jane did lots of q and A. I've met all of the doctors on a big Zoom. So everyone's been so welcoming. And what I have noticed that's different to my previous organisation. So I worked in what's called an acute hospital, which is where you have A&Es and um, it's an adult hospital, uh, two different hospitals and community services as well. Um, so when I worked there, it um, obviously a very busy hospital, as is the children's and the women's. The vibe at this trust is completely different. So I have done tours of both of the sites. Obviously I was wearing a mask and didn't go near any patients and it was all very safe. When I went round um, and I've met um, with and been over to Forward Thinking Birmingham as well, and I've got another meeting next Friday, I expected the patients and their families to be really miserable because they were in hospital with things um, that were really seriously wrong. I met a mum who was in with her daughter who'd just been diagnosed with cancer. She was in Waterfall House. And I expected everyone to be really grumpy because if I was in hospital, I envis envisaged that if I was in hospital with my child, I'd be really sad and really panicked the whole time. It wasn't like that at all. So the parents that I met and the children were joyful. Everybody knew what was happening. Everyone knew what the treatment plan was. And there was everyone so optimistic and the energy is really bright and light and sunshiny um, and I just felt that was beautiful and it made me feel very um, very calm and very welcome and it also made me feel really happy because if my children were going to be 
um, poorly, I would want them to be treated and to heal in that environment. So um, that's been my biggest surprise, so, although I don't know why I was surprised because I've always lived in Birmingham and always um, both of my brothers have been to the children's hospital for operations and everything's been fantastic and the care is fantastic. And the women's, I love babies. I really was um, looking forward to coming and I've been around all of neonates and saw all the little tiny babies in there. Everyone's just been amazing. And what I have found so beautiful is that um, the energy of both of the sites that I've been around and that I work at mainly. Everybody's smiling at each other, everyone really cares about the patients um, and cares about the families as well and really involve the families in what's going on. And like with you guys, involving you in your own care and your own services and in shaping them and really listening to that. And everybody likes to have a bit of a laugh as well. It's been so serious, hasn't it? Everything to do with COVID has been really serious. But at work, people are focusing on, OK, how can we bring the most joy to this patient or to this baby or to this parent today or to this woman or to this person experiencing our services? And I found that really refreshing and really uplifting um, and very light. So um, that's been my initial reflections of the first seven weeks, seven weeks and two days. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the next seven years. So thank you for having me and for choosing me on the panel. Thank you. So I think people are more positively talking about mental health um, in 2020. And what's been really positive actually that's come out of COVID is people have quite openly talked about the impact of the pandemic on their mental health. For example, being at home um, or working from home when you're used to going into work or maybe the impact on your mental health of going to university and then isolating and being isolated with maybe people that you don't necessarily vibe with or that you don't like or people that you don't know. Um, it has had a significant impact on people's mental health. And I think people are talking about it. They're either talking about it through social media channels um, uh, or reaching out to um, health professionals, for example. We've seen a real increase in... Um, referrals of people who are experiencing acute mental health um, issues but I think that people are talking about it more informally as well and also talking about it within their families about the impact of um, for example the pandemic or the increase in social media or whatever it is that is, tr is triggering um, poorer mental health. I think that talking about um, mental health issues or talking about feelings and saying it being okay to say, I'm not okay, I need support with X, Y, or Z, um, I find it incredibly important. And um, within my own team um, and within my own life, I think that um, we need to create opportunities for people to say that. So um, my friends have supported me, I've supported my friends, and um, we do it at work in terms of work colleagues as well. Um, because some people won't ever have spoken about things that are going on for them and maybe then the pandemic has exacerbated it, it's made it worse and actually people are coming forward now and saying I really need some support on this. Um, I think involving young people is critically important. I also think involving um, different uh, staff members from different communities, from different different ethnicities, national nationalities, because in some cultures it's not okay to say that you have a mental health issue. Um, it's particularly in um, some of the um, male elements or patriarchal cultures typically. And we have a whole myriad of cultures in Birmingham and Solihull. And those people will be using our services, um, either coming to Forward Think in Birmingham or um, their parents and themselves using um, the services at the Children's Hospital and certainly if you think about the impact on pregnant women um, and the women using services um, over at the Women's Hospital. Um, I think that through our staff networks um, that we started to, um, to develop within the organisation, one of those um, networks is particularly around disability and long-term conditions and specifically within the long-term conditions are mental health um, conditions, for example, bipolar disorder. In my old organisation, the chair of the um, disability network was um, did have bipolar and very openly talked about it. And when he was having acute episodes, talked about the impact um, on him. But also what that does is it starts a conversation. So it starts a conversation between you and your line manager or for your colleague to ask you, well, I don't know what bipolar disorder is. What is that? Um, how do you need me to work with you or react to you differently when you're having an episode or when you're manic or when you're down? 
um, and people are getting more comfortable about um, having those conversations. But I think what's going to be so important about involving young people, I think young people are absolutely so much more confident about talking about mental health. And it's people um, who are older, like me, I'm 43. When I was at school, we didn't talk about mental health issues at all. It just wasn't ever talked about. I went to a girls' school as well and it wasn't talked about. Um, so we need you to push us to talk about um, mental health issues and the impact on lives, on employment, um, so that we can start to think about that in, you know, when we're making policies or employment practice. Um, we need you to push us on that. So please don't stop doing that. Continue to talk about mental health, continue to push us um, as organisations and also in other forums that you're involved in and then we can make the change together. So thank you, really, really good question. And I've gone on and on talking about it, but um, it is something that I'm very passionate about. So thank you for asking.